So uh, let's continue the discussion from the previous episode. But first, a word from our sponsor. Do you suffer from embarrassing ignorance due to epistemological deficiency? Take new extra strength apophatic antifragility for fast, fast ontological relief. Check with your doctor first. <laughs> the thing about Neo is, he knows the world he lives in isn't real, even though it may seem to be real, and everyone around him believes that it's real. But he just has this unsettling feeling that it's actually an illusion. And he begins to inquire into this, and at first he's not at all successful. But after repeated efforts, he finally reaches someone who knows. And they offer to share this knowledge with him, but they also make a choice. Blue pill or the red pill. So Neo has to choose. In other words, he has to take responsibility for the consequences of his action, for the consequences of looking into the cracks in the facade of the illusion of the world. And similarly, we do too. It's called losing our innocence. So with that, we'll resume the discussion from where we left off last time. Let's look into our limited scope of knowledge. In other words, ignorance. <laughs> well, what kind of ignorance is it? How is it structured? You know, if we're in a trap, or if we're locked in a room someplace, if we know how the trap is built, or if we saw, let's say on the way in, how the room is opened, how it's accessed, or how it's built, then we have a lot better chance of getting out of that situation. So similarly, if we know how our ignorance is structured, not just that we are ignorant, but how we are ignorant, uh, what are the details? Then we have a better chance of getting out of our ignorance and attaining some real knowledge. Let's take a look at this. We're ignorant because we consider results instead of possibilities. When we look at a situation, we tend to ask ourselves, well, what happened? But we should be asking ourselves, what didn't happen, but could have? Why is that? Because it makes us analyze the whole situation, the whole process. It makes us also uh, do a what-if kind of calculation. Okay, and, uh, this is called a Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation simply means we take a system and we subject it to all the possible inputs that it could ever have. And we see what comes out. In other words, not what did happen, but what could happen given any possible outcomes or any possible inputs. You get the picture? In other words, let's say, okay, uh, I went to college and actually kind of a lesser known um, music conservatory and I got a degree in composition and because of that I was able to enter a certain uh, composition contest and I won and because of that exposure I got a lucky break and I wound up working in New York City along with people from the top conservatories in the world Oberlin Juilliard, NYU School of Music, and so on. So that's what happened. But what could have happened? Well, if you look at all the possibilities, the most likely thing that would have happened 
is that I would have gotten out and, and not had a job and have to go on playing with bands and stuff like that, making, you know, peanuts on weekends and maybe teaching, um, oh, this is what a terrible thought, teaching music during the week. Ah, uh, horrible. So in other words, teachers are losers. <laughs> teachers are the people who didn't get the lucky break. The people who teach can't do. And the people who do really don't want to teach. They want to keep everybody else ignorant so that they can continue to win. I'll be honest with you. Very few people are going to give you the keys to their kingdom. Huh? There are very few people are going to give you competitive knowledge. Like one trader that, that I talked to, uh, and this guy had survived so many crashes and so many meltdowns. <laughs> He'd been in trade in 30 or 40 years and was still going strong. And I, and I asked him, I said, what's your secret? And, and he said, you know what, if I told you, I wouldn't be able to do what I do anymore because there wouldn't be enough suckers. <laughs> Those were his exact words. Well, later on, I found out what he did, but that's another story. In other words, the people who really understand what the possibilities are in life aren't talking. Uh, they're not going to tell you this, what I'm telling you right now. I don't care. You can come on and, and compete with me and you can bring out another video series that on, on the same subject. I don't care. I hope that people get this knowledge because it's going to make the world a better place for everyone. I'm not in competition with anybody. I already won the prize. So I'm, I don't have anything to worry about and I don't need any suckers either. So the problem is we focus on what we think we know, which is cataphatic knowledge. And so remain unaware of what we don't know or the apophatic knowledge. See, the Buddha's teaching is talking about apophatic knowledge. What we don't know. When we go into a situation, the first thing we should do is take stock of what we know and what we don't know. Most people do who think at all <laughs> will do the former but not the latter. So it's more important to know what we don't know. It's more important to know what we can't see than what we can. Because the things we can't see are what is going to bite us. The things that we can't see or don't know are going to be the source of the unexpected events. The things that can either wipe us out or make our day. Depending on how we position ourselves. Our strategy. See, life is strategic. It's not tactical. What's the difference? Tactical means deciding what to do in the heat of the moment. It's opportunism. It's spontaneity. Now, spontaneity is all good in its place. But on a lifespan level, we need a strategy. We need a strategy because we have to be prepared for the unlikely things that could happen. Those unlikely things that come along once in a lifetime, once in a blue moon, as the expression goes. And they can either boost us up in the sky if we're anti-fragile, or if we're fragile to them, they can finish the game for us. Over. So, we remain unaware of what we don't know uh, the apophatic knowledge, and then we project the past into the future. In other words, we think that the future is going to resemble the past. No, it's not. It never is going to resemble the past. Why? Because there are black swans. <laughs> Those unexpected, unlikely, extreme um, improbable events. The nature of improbability is that it has not happened yet. 
It's so improbable that over the history of the knowledge or observation of whatever it is we're talking about, that particular thing never happened. Does that mean that it can't happen? No, not at all. See, but that's inductive reasoning. Well, it didn't happen in the past, so it's not going to happen in the future. Wrong. That's why the stock traders go bankrupt. That's why banks fail. That's why revolutions succeed and governments fail. That's why all the big changes in the world happen. And that's why, as I said in the earlier slide, the once-in-a-lifetime, unlikely, improbable, extreme, unanticipated, unpredictable event is the one that has all the impact. Why? Everybody's fragile to it. Nobody has planned for it. Fukushima. Huh? They looked at the, at the past earthquakes in, I think it was the last hundred years, and they said, well, we never had one of more than 3.3 .3 or something like that. So they built Fukushima power plant to withstand a 3.3 .3 earthquake. And then what do they get? 7.2 or something like that. And of course, the thing wasn't ready for it. It blew up. So this is <laughs> apophatic knowledge. They What they didn't know is that that fault underneath that power plant was capable of maybe 8.5 at the outside. But because it never happened before, they inductively concluded that it wasn't going to happen in the future. Wrong. So what you need to know before you go into any situation is what could happen. Everything that could happen, positive or negative. And then you position yourself, you strategize, you plan so that you are anti-fragile, so that you would benefit from the volatility instead of being overwhelmed by it. Otherwise, we will consistently underestimate our exposure to both risk and opportunity. Exposure means you're going to be affected by it. And just like if I'm investing in a certain stock, then I'm exposed to whatever is going to happen to that stock, whether it goes up or down. So I, I want exposure to all kinds of events if I'm anti-fragile. See? If I not only buy the stock, but I also buy some uh, puts and calls on the stock. Then if the stock goes up a little bit, then my calls go way up. If the stock goes down a little bit, then my puts go way up. Oh, and by the way, I also put some stop loss on my options so that if they lose more than 5%, they automatically cashed in. This is called anti-fragile trading strategy. Okay, so we need an anti-fragile strategy for life. And this is what the Buddhist teaching gives us. Now, the Buddhist teaching is about improbable events, death, rebirth, enlightenment. These don't happen within our normal sphere of awareness. They happen outside. We went through an, an extensive analysis of death in our series, Living in the World. You should go back and review that to understand how our attitude towards death really is what makes our whole life. Because if we live with awareness of death every moment, if we make every choice as if it could be our last, we will live a completely different life than if we think, oh, death is somewhere far away, and maybe it's coming someday, but I have plenty of time. Huh? We're going to live a much more casual, much less engaged, much less profound existence than if we're conscious that death could happen at any time. So the Buddha's teaching 
is not theoretical knowledge. It's based on practice, not theory. And there's a famous saying, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're different. My favorite philosopher, modern philosopher, Yogi Berra. <laughs> Why is Yogi Berra my favorite philosopher? Because he's a practitioner. His philosophical musings come from extensive experience. They're not theory. They're based on practice. So he knows before he formulates his pithy sayings, because he has experienced all, or at least most of the possibilities of his particular game, which in his case is baseball. So the Buddha's teaching is based on practice. It's aimed at practitioners. It's not based, or it's not for people who are into book learning. It's not for religious people. It's for people who are sick and tired of their suffering and they want to get out. So the Buddha's teaching is very practical. Uh, it's, it's meant that you're, uh, you're supposed to hear a teaching from the Buddha and then go sit down and implement it. Huh? Right then, immediately after hearing. Because that's what the monks did in the Buddha's presence. They would hear a discourse from the Buddha and then they would go sit and meditate all night. That's why so many of them became enlightened. Unlike now when we like, you know, read something or watch some video on the web and then go to work or go to school or, you know, have dinner with our friends or <laughs> and then go to sleep and forget all about it. So anyway, due to our limited scope of knowledge, our ordinary common sense inductive logic does not deal adequately adequately with improbable events. We tend to conclude by inductive knowledge, inductive logic, that the future is going to be like the past. And it's not. Why? Because the future contains improbable, unlikely, new, never before seen, unpredictable events. Do you think by studying this subject matter that you're going to be able to predict the special events? No. Nobody can predict. That's why prophecy is not forecasting. <laughs> or forecasting is not prophecy. Nobody can say, there is going to be a stock market crash tomorrow at 2 p.m. If anybody says that, or if anybody predicts the end of the world on a certain day, run as far as you, as fast as you can. <laughs> Because they're an idiot. <laughs> now, they might just be lucky and get it right. <laughs> but in most cases, they get it wrong. Well, we don't know about how many got it wrong because they are invisible. Because they got it wrong. We only, we only get to see the winners. We only got to see the guy who called it right. The guy who called it wrong disappears into the swamp of history and is never seen or heard of again. Because we don't think or we don't admit that extreme events are not only possible, but absolutely unpredictable. We don't prepare for them. You might say, well, why should I prepare for something that I can't predict? Precisely because you can't predict it. If we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there would be a nuclear war next week, then everybody would rush out and prepare for it, right? But guess what? Because everybody is trying to prepare at the same time, the stores would quickly be sold out and, <laughs> and they wouldn't be able to prepare adequately. Guess who is going to make it? The guy who prepares five, ten years before it happens not knowing when it's going to happen, but just knowing that it's something that could happen. So he prepares for it. He strategizes. He positions himself so that whatever happens, nuclear war, financial meltdown, 
uh, political strife or whatever, he's ready for it. He's got, you know, six months supply of food. So, in other words, our ignorance, our limited scope of knowledge means that, as Einstein said, what we call common sense is just a collection of childish misconceptions. And the end of the quote is that um, gathered before the age of 18. <laughs> so in other words, stupid stuff we learned in school. Now, remember, our position or our attitude towards school is that it's something that's designed to keep people ignorant. It's, it's purposely made to keep people stupid. Why? Because they're easier to control. So governments use school to create uh, easy to manage population. It's not about learning. It's not about making you smart. So the things that you learn in school are largely useless. I think most of you have noticed that if you're watching this. But the real answer is strategic to take control of your own education. And we give you the tools to do that in the Becoming Genius series. So go back and watch it again, please. Take it seriously this time. Now, another problem is that real knowledge, sophisticated ideas, take time to explain, effort to understand, and persistence to master. In other words, they're not cheap. If somebody is giving you real knowledge, like we're trying to do here, it's going to take some time for us to explain it. Uh, this tape might run, I don't know, an hour. But it's going to take many, many episodes of this kind of explanation to adequately expound our idea. You're not going to get it in just one viewing of one video. I'm sorry, it, the idea is too big. It has too many ramifications. It touches on too many different subjects to explore in one video. You have to invest the time to go through it in order to get the knowledge. When I first came across this knowledge, I was confused, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> it, it threw me. Huh? Apophatic antifragility, you know? Well, it sounds cool. What is it? I started to read up on it, and I'm like, whoa. Why? Because so many habits of thinking, so many ingrained uh, perceptions of reality are actually false. Same with the Buddha's teaching. When you first start to read it, if you really read it, <laughs> if you go and define all the terms and you really think about it, you'll realize it's the greatest challenge to your preconceptions of anything you've ever encountered. So these ideas take some effort to understand. They're not easy. You have to sit down and think about it, or even better, go for a walk and think about it. Some physical exercise really helps process information. That's what I'm going to do as soon as I'm done with this tape. <laughs> and they take persistence to master. Why? You have to learn how to apply it. And there's no substitute for experience. An experience can be positive or negative and still be helpful. Sometimes you get it wrong and you wind up having to redo the whole thing from the start. Reboot your mind, <laughs> recalibrate your understandings from the beginning. That's okay. That's how you make it. That's how you get there. That's how you become a genius. Okay, so you have to follow the process to get the result. Little sound bites, little 10 second, uh, you know, cunning little sayings. And most journalism are almost always wrong, or at least they're distorted. Why? The medium is the message. I cannot say what apophatic uh, anti fragility is in 10 seconds without distorting it or actually getting it completely wrong. The idea is too deep. Huh? The concept is too complex to fit in a soundbite or even in a, you know, an article, an online uh, news article or something like that. 
it's not going to fit in 500 words or even a thousand words. It's probably going to take me close to 50,000 words just to express what I really mean by it. Apophatic empty fragility. <laughs> and finally, ease of expression does not equal correct. It does not equal the truth. Just because something is easy to say, a catchy phrase that's easy to remember, doesn't mean it's true. Okay, so we have to beware of economy. Too much economy it always distorts the truth. Let's take E equals MC squared. Every school child can recite it, and none of them know what it means. Isn't it? Okay, E equals MC squared. How do you derive it? Uh, how do you start from the ordinary laws of physics and derive it? Well, it turns out it requires something called tensor calculus, which uses three-valued logic. Uh, are you ready for that? Then you're not ready for Einstein because that was Einstein's language. E equals mc squared is just the, you know, handy catchphrase for dinner conversation. His actual ideas are much deeper than that and take much more complex math to explain. But that's not for the consumption of idiots. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.